Oh, it's so good to be back. I always enjoy uh, coming coming home, even though, you know, home now has been for 26 years out there in the greater Chicagoland area. And, uh, you know, God's been good to us. It's been just like every church in America right now. It's been a rough time, you know, uh, numbers up and down, but there's some blessings too. Uh, you know, in the midst of it all, I, I wanted to get our church online a number of years ago, and I just, there was no drive for it. And then the first week of the pandemic came and we couldn't meet in person. And uh, uh, so we went online. There was a step ladder in front of the pulpit with a little uh, webcam on the top of it and a computer in the front row, and that's how we did it. And over the next few months, uh, somebody donated four pan tilt zoom cameras and all remotely controlled and we now have a four camera system that's bigger than some big churches and you all got the nice system because you always had television here but uh, it's really cool and we get people who watch from all over the world my wife and I host exchange students and we currently this year have had a girl from Germany finally we're able to get exchange students to come again because our school district wasn't allowing it and we had a girl from Germany and a girl from uh, Malaysia. And our girl from Malaysia is with us, but she wasn't feeling well tonight. So uh, she stayed uh, back at the, the room and uh, just she just was worn out. We took her to D.C. and dragged her all over that place yesterday. And uh, she's from Malaysia, but she wore this pink like business suit, skirt, coat, the whole thing with dress shoes, walking around from D.C. from the Capitol building to the Lincoln Memorial and over to the White House. And she says today she has blisters on her feet. We don't know why, you know? And she almost experienced heat stroke. I'm like, you don't have to dress that nicely, but she's a big fan of that K-pop band that was at the White House yesterday. And I think she was convinced she was going to meet them at the White House. I'm like, no, ain't happening. And she's like, but you never know, I could just see. No, ain't happening. And we got there. She's like, is this as close as we can get to the White House? I'm like, yeah. You think, go try to jump the fence if you want. It'd be fun to watch you get chased down. She's only about this tall. And, uh, but we've had fun showing her around and took her out to Fort McHenry today. And then uh, family's doing well. Uh, and what I was saying about the, zoo, the, the camera and the, the video is, we already got our students picked for next year, a boy from Bosnia and a boy from Tajikistan. If you don't know where those countries are, I didn't know either. Just look it up. And uh, our boy from Tajikistan is watching every week now and, and preparing to come. And he's uh, from a Sunni Muslim background. And he's hearing the gospel already before he comes. And we're, we're excited because he leaves comments in the chat room in the chat of the of the of the video and so we know he's watching i acknowledged him on the the webcast the other day and he was all excited about that i usually have to start with something humorous and i we uh tammy and i have five grandkids one of them we got through marriage and he is in the marines now he's over in japan the other four are five years old, five years old, seven years old, and eight years old. Well, one of the five-year-olds would come and spend time at our house a couple times every week. And a couple weeks ago, Tammy was gone, so I took everybody out to dinner. And we went to Olive Garden, and we're sitting at the table. And the five-year-old's there, and I ordered these uh, fried rotini roll or something with cheese in the middle, and you dip it in sauce. And I said, you might want to try these. She goes, I've tried them. I don't like them. I said, okay. So I look over a minute later, she's dipping in the sauce and eating them. I go, I said, I thought you didn't like those. And she looks at me with those innocent eyes and goes, I lied. (laughs) I go, why? She goes, it's fun to fool old people. (laughs) You know... I never thought I was old. But I'll tell you, I came here and I just looked around and there's a lot more gray heads than when I was here a few years ago. I'll just tell you that. And then there's a few like mine that have less hair. 
Hey, we live in a world that's full of worry. It is a, a world, is, in fact, there are websites that will tell you what things you should worry about in 2022. As if we don't know. But let me just give you a few, not from the list, but from my personal bestseller list. I think inflation is one. Every time I pull up to the gas pump, I got to pray, Lord, let my account have enough money, please, just to fill this car one more time. Food prices. If you're a new mother, there's a, a shortage of baby formula. There's a war in Ukraine. A few years ago, you might have met our, our girl from the Ukraine who was with us when we visited at Christmas time and New Year's, and her, she was here with us. And we've been in touch with her and uh, talked to her a number of times. And she left the country and went into Poland, and her grandmother stayed. She lived with her grandmother, and her grandmother said, I'll fight till the end. And uh, she's since been able to go back into the country and she's with her grandmother again. But there's a war in Ukraine. The war in Ukraine has caused a shortage of fertilizer, ammonia for fertilizers. And we could have, they're talking in the next few months, a possible food shortage. I, I mean, I, I worry about our kids, or you could worry about your kids and what they're learning, and what they're being taught, and the things that are going on in schools, the violence. I know Baltimore's experienced a spike, as well as Chicago has experienced a spike in violence. There was a 17-year-old shot at one of our tourist attractions just a few weeks ago at the Bean, just shot down. And then there was a shooting at a McDonald's just a few block or two off the downtown area. I've been to that McDonald's. I've been in there and, and grabbed myself a Diet Coke and a cheeseburger. And a guy just walked in and was a rival gang member and opened fire on another one. And a number of people got struck and killed. Violence. But tonight, I, I just want to talk about this subject of worry for a minute because I think the Bible teaches, don't worry, be happy. And I don't mean to just quote the song, but I'm going to quote some scripture here. And I want you to open your Bible to the book of Matthew chapter 6 with me for just a moment. We're going to be looking at a familiar passage of Scripture in Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 34. And Jesus tells us how to have a happy life. And when we come to verse 27, through the end of this chapter, we read these verses that say, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought of your life, what you shall eat, what you shall drink, <clears throat> nor for your body, what you'll put on, is not the life more than meat, not the body more than raiment. And, and he goes on. You know, 2,000 years ago, our Lord said these words, and they're as current today as they were then. I mean, people who say, you know what, Pastor Phil? The Bible just doesn't address the modern society. You know, there's a theological term for that, baloney. It does. It addresses the modern world. It addresses things today just as well as it did back in those days because you know what? The Bible tells stories about people. It was people who lived then. It's people who live now. It was people who were following Jesus and people who had worries just like you and me. And, and, and I want to tell you, when you see the word, therefore, in the Bible... You, you, it's a question, and what is the therefore, therefore? He's referring to what he had just said, and he's been talking in the previous verses about the dangers of materialism, about letting things get out of proportion in your life. And Jesus was brought up among common people. Mary and Joseph were not rich people. They were common people. His dad was a carpenter. And he knew what it was like to not maybe have all the necessities and all the goodies of life. And he was acquainted with work. He knew what it was like to be a laboring person. He was, he was probably trained by his legal father, Joseph. And so he understood what life in the ordinary was. And the Bible says that the common people heard him gladly. And, and, and I've always thought that was one of the greatest compliments that Jesus ever received is that the everyday people flocked to him. 
and wanted to hear him and listen to him. And it's in that atmosphere and in that context that Jesus gives these words to not take any thought, and let me rephrase it, to not worry about things. If I counted correctly, he specifically commands us three times not to worry. He specifically says that we're not to worry about food. We're not to worry about what goes in our body. He tells us we're not to worry about clothes. We're not to worry about what goes on our body. And of course, you know, those are exactly the things that we worry about, don't we? I, our, our girls uh, this year, our exchange girls, there's one of them that the minute she walks in the door from school says, Dad, what's the plan for dinner? A lot of times I say, I don't know. And she gives me a look like you should know. But right away. And how many of you are the same? You know, you're thinking, I remember going to my grandparents' house. My grandparents, they were, they were hillbillies from West Virginia. My grandmother would get done feeding us a breakfast that had biscuits and gravy and pancakes and eggs and bacon and sausage. And we would roll ourselves away from the table. And she's not even cleaned up the table and she's looking and going to my mom. Well, Millie, what do you think we ought to make for lunch? And we're all sitting there in a food coma going, lunch? Can we digest breakfast yet? But we worry about what we're going to eat. We worry about clothing. We worry about everything. We, we, it's, for many, worry is a favorite indoor sport. I heard about a wor- wor- man who worried so much the hair fell out of his wig. Another man hired somebody. He got tired of worrying, so he decided to hire a guy. And he says, I want to hire you to worry for me. And I'm going to pay you $100,000 a year. The guy goes, my word, that's great. He goes, well, where are you going to get that money? He says, that's your first worry. (laughs) You know? (laughs) And yet Jesus said we are not to worry. And if we do worry, we're disobeying Jesus, and that's a sin. And I'm going to tell you something. This is a sin that I think we like to brag about sometimes. You know, I've talked to a lot of people. I've, I've met, I, because of my work with the police, I've met some people who are nefarious characters. And never once did any of them say, I stayed up all night robbing stores and taking things. They don't confess it. They're not, they're not proud of it. They don't want to go out there and say that. But how many of us have said, I stayed up all night tossing and turning, worrying about blank, blank, blank. And yet Jesus tells us what? Don't worry. Don't worry. Don't worry. And yet we do. And he says, blessed are you when? And now he says, don't worry. And the word there for worry literally means to pull apart. It's it's the opposite of peace. Peace means to put back together. God's peace puts our lives back together. And when we worry, it pulls us apart and affects our spiritual life. It affects our emotional life. It affects our physical life. You know, there are certain physical problems that attach themselves to worry. Ulcers. When you get an ulcer, it's it's not so much about what you're eating. It's what eats you. Heart attacks. A heart attack is, is almost always a... Something that has almost become a status symbol in our day. I worked so hard, I got a heart attack. You know? And I'll tell you what, Dr. Charles Mayo, one of the founders of the Mayo Clinic, says that anxiety and anxious care is something that affects us. He said, worry affects the circulation, the heart, the glands, the whole nervous system. I've never met a man or known a man to die of overwork, but I've known a whole lot who died of worry. That's one of the Mayo brothers. And so it has a physical effect on us. And yet Jesus told us not to worry, and he gives us some reason not to worry. And the first reason is it's senseless. Look at verse 25. He says, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought of your life, know what you should eat or what you should drink or what you should put in your body. For what, what you should put on is not more than life, more than meat, and, and the body more than raiment. He says, Listen, 
He, he argues from the greater to the lesser. And the root point of verse 25 is God is our creator. God is the one who created our body. God is the one who created our life. And, and this is, by the way, is why I believe that life begins at the moment of conception. We're doing the same VBS this year, and I'm excited about that. And I believe that's one of the reasons that we see the killings that we do in our society today is because we have taught our youth that life is not valuable beginning in the womb. Side point. But anyway, he's saying that God is the creator of life and he argues from the greater, the, the greater the creation to the lesser of the ability to take care of the creation. In other words, what he's trying to say, if God is able to make your body, he's able to take care of your body. And so it is senseless to worry. Take no thought. He's talking about life as we live it. He says, don't spend time troubling yourselves over the food you wear and the clothes you're going to wear. He's saying that, that there's so much more to life than this. And the God who gave you that meaning and your existence is saying there's more than just the physical to life. Jesus says that man's life does not consist in the abundance of things that he possesses. That's why we shouldn't be covetous of just material things and have a constant uh, covetous of material things and be, have a constant preoccupation about what we have. And if God created your life, taking care of your life is peanuts to him. It's easy. He can take care of you. He can take care of you. If he created you, he can take care of you. And it's senseless to worry. He goes on and he argues that now the lesser to the greater. He look at verse 26. He says, Behold the fowls of the air, the birds of the air. For they, do, they sow not, neither do they reap, nor do they gather in barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are you not much better than they? Now I can almost imagine that as he said this, a pigeon came flying by. I, I like to imagine things like that. I believe these stories are real. And he's the God of everything. I imagine if he thought pigeon, a pigeon came running or flying, I guess. You know, my grandfather used to catch pigeons for me and my brother. He'd chum them in with peanuts on the lakeshore and grab them and hold them up to our face and we'd run away. But, but he says, look at the birds. And you know what he's saying? He's not saying that the birds don't work. We have, if you, if you watch my Facebook page, you saw that we have two robin's nests that have been placed in our church. At, not at our church, but, you know, on one of the carport beams and the other one. And I watch those birds build those nests. Oh, birds work. They get the sticks. They bring them. They form these nests. They... They, they work, it's just that they don't have to worry about what they're going to eat because they know God's going to take care of them. And Jesus says, if God can take care of birds and you are more valuable than a bird, he is going to take care of you too. He's going to, he's going to take care of you. And, and I don't want some people to say, well, Jesus is saying we don't have to work. No, the birds work, they do their thing. He's just saying the birds do their part, God does his. They go out, they make their nest, they do the things they're supposed to do, and God feeds them, takes care of them. Put, God put the food and the environment around them, equip them with the right kind of beak to get exactly the food necessary. He takes care of those itty-bitty birds. Not only does he say, though, that worry is senseless, he says it's useless. Look at verse 27. He says, which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit to a stature? And, and, and you could say this, which of you could, could uh, add any distance to your life? And, and 18 inches is about a cubit, foot and a half. And there are two different interpretations of this. One is saying, who can, by worry, add any height to a stature? How many of you remember the episode of, of, of uh, Andy Griffith... When, when Barney was just too short to make being a sheriff by the new standards of the state. And they put him in this thing where his head hung and it stretched him so he grew an inch to be able to pass the test to be a, a, a deputy sheriff. 
Well, that's the first interpretation. The second one, I think, is closer. And, and it's, it's talking about adding length to your life. And I think it's closer to what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying that worry doesn't add any length or days to your life. As best I can tell, and, and Dr. Harmon is a much smarter man than I, but the only man who ever, uh, the only man who added life, added to his life was, was Hezekiah. And the Lord came to Hezekiah and told him to set his house in order and he was going to die and not live. And Hezekiah cried and begged and God extended his life. And when you read the rest of Hezekiah, uh, you have to wonder if maybe he would have prayed that prayer if he knew what was going to come later. But God is the one who is in charge of your life. God is the one who knows how long we're going to live. It is God who can add or take away to the length of our life. Worry cannot add to your life, but I am convinced that worry can take away from your life. If you labor with the whole problem of anxiety and care, it just doesn't help. Worry is useless. It's like rocking in a rocking chair and hoping you're going to get somewhere. And so Jesus says worry is senseless. Worry is useless, but finally, worry is faithless. Look at verse 30. Wherefore, if God can clothe the grass of the field, which it today is, and tomorrow is cast in the oven, shall you not much more he clothe you? O ye of little faith. Jesus is saying that when we worry, we're faithless. We have little faith. And to worry is to be faithless. And he goes into the world of nature again. He talked about birds, and now he's going to talk about flowers. He says, consider, consider the lilies of the field. Verse 28, how they grow and they toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of them. He says, learn a lesson from the lilies. Solomon, the richest man who ever lived, could have any clothes he want. Gucci, Brooks Brothers, you pick the designer you want. He could have had them all. He could have wore a different custom tailored suit every week or every day. And he said, God does a better job with the flowers than he ever could with clothing, with you with clothing. Solomon could not deck himself out like a flower. And you can put it under a microscope. And, and the more you see of of the way God created creation is just perfection. It's beautiful. And we can't improve on God's creation. And he says, listen, if God put that kind of detail into flowers that are going to die and they're going to take and throw them in the oven and what they would do in those days, they had clay ovens and when they needed a little extra fire and a little extra heat, they would take these dried dead flowers and throw them into the oven to create fire. And one moment they're here and the next moment they're burned up. And yet God etches such beauty and design into those and they're here for a little while and they're gone. God is going to take care of you. Don't worry. Don't worry. Don't be faithless. Don't be faithless. Don't be. In fact, this term, it, it, it's believed that Jesus kind of coined this term. O ye of little faith. Because he's the only one who uses it here. And he uses it to the disciples. In fact, when Peter started to sink, when he's walking on water, he goes, you, oh, you of little faith. You faithless person. Jesus doesn't want us to be faithless. Jesus wants us to have faith and believe in him. And when we worry, what we're saying is, God, I don't trust you. I better take care of this problem on my own. I got I to gotta worry about it. And worrying gets us nowhere. You know, my Bible says in Philippians 4.19, I don't know about your Bible, but mine says, my God shall supply all your need. Not your greed, but all your need. Do you believe that today? I know some of you might be here and you're worried about, oh, the job isn't going well, I could get laid off. I'm worried about where I'm going to get money to put gas in the car. I'm worried about this. I'm worried about that. I don't know. And you might be sitting here in this sermon tonight distracted by worry. Can I tell you something? 
My God shall supply all your need. Don't be faithless. Don't be faithless. Trust Him. So let me give you three reasons why we shouldn't worry, and then I'll close. The first cure to worry is found in verse 33. It says, For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, but your Father in heaven knoweth that you have not these things. You know what he's saying? Put first things first. Seek ye first, verse 33, the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and God shall add all these things to you. Put first things first. Get put first things first. If you want to get uptight and anxious about something, I'll give you something to get uptight and anxious about. Get very, very concerned about seeing to it that Jesus is first in your life. Get worried that Jesus isn't first in your life. Put Him first. Make Him the priority. Don't worry about everything else because when you put Him first where He belongs, guess what? All these things shall be added unto you. He takes care of the rest. He takes care of the wet rest. Next, number two, verse 34. Take no thought of tomorrow, for tomorrow shall take care of itself. Let me tell you something. Let the future be the future. The language is a little bit different to understand. Take there before no thought. That is, don't worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will take thought for things of itself. Sufficient to the day is the evil thereof. Jesus is trying to set, is saying, if you want to win over worry, quit bringing tomorrow's troubles today and make them part of today's anxiety. Put first things first and let the future be the future. And, and some people come to me sometimes, I have this overwhelming feeling that something bad is going to happen. I'm going to tell you, it'll probably be a self-fulfilling prophecy. You know, I don't know about you, but I got enough things on my mind today to worry about tomorrow, let alone two months from now, three months from now. Just take it a day at a time and let God take care of everything in, in your life. You know, just let him care for it. Let me give you a few quick promises. Hebrews 4.16, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in times of need. You know what? Literally, he will give us grace to help in the nick of time. God promises daily grace, and you're not going to get tomorrow's grace today. You're going to get today's grace today, and trust him. He begs you to come to him and take every one of your problems and worries to him and let him take care of it. Secondly, Deuteronomy 33, 25 says, Your sandals should be iron and bronze as your days, so shall your strength be as your days. Whatever the day may bring, God will give you the strength to get through it. There are some days, I have some very hard, very long days. But every one of those days, God gives me the strength to get through them. I can tell you, your pastor's a busy man. He's a busy man. But I think he'd be the first to tell you, that sometimes in the midst of the battle, sometimes in the midst of everything going on, the sermons he's got to prepare, the people he's got to visit, the, the day-to-day issues of the church, you know. And in fact, I remember Paul said he was beaten, he was whipped, he was done, shipwrecked, all this. And on top of all that, the cares of the church which come daily. It was almost like Paul saying, you know, they can beat me, they can shipwreck me, they can whip me. And oh my goodness, all that's little compared to the cares of the church. Oh, let me tell you. But I can tell you this. As a pastor of a church that has this many things to take care of compared to this church that has this many, probably bigger than that, God gives you the strength for the day to get through. And let me tell you something. Dr. Harmon's not a superman. I'm sorry, Carolyn, he's not. I'm not Superman. I know that. Watch me get up from a chair. You'll find that out. I can't 
get up from a chair hardly, let alone leap tall buildings in a single bound. But you know what? God gives me the strength to get through each day. Just what I need, when I need it, He comes through. And you know what? That same strength that He gives to every pastor, it's not exclusive to us. We don't have rights to it. It's not only given to us. It's given to everybody in this room. He will get you through the day. Lamentations 3.22 and 23. You know this. Through the Lord's mercies we are not consumed. Because of His compassions they fail not. They are new every morning. Great is His faithfulness. Just as every morning is new, God's mercy every day He takes care of us. There's an old fable about a clock that was just ticking along and been on the wall for years. And one day, the clock got to thinking, oh my goodness, I'm ticking every second. That means I'm ticking 60 ticks a minute, 3,600 ticks an hour, which means I'm doing 86,400 ticks a day. At that rate, that's 31,536,000,000 ticks a year. I can't do it. I'll wear out. And the poor clock got to worrying about it. And just then the clock thought, all that is required of me is just a tick, one tick at a time. So if I just tick one tick at a time, I'll worry about all the ticks that I have to do down the road. You know what? Take care today. Make God first in your life today because worry is senseless, it's useless, and it means we're faithless. Trust God. Father God, thank you so much for the truth of your word. And I, Father, the, the person I, I'm thinking about tonight is the person who might be under the sound of my voice who's never trusted Jesus as Savior and doesn't have that truth in his life that you are there with him every step of the way and that you give them the strength to get through life and that you're caring for them. Lord, I pray that they'd come to understand that you died for them you were buried and you rose again the third day so that they could have eternal life. And I pray, Lord, that if there's anybody under the sound of my voice who's never trusted Jesus, that today the biggest worry of their life would be taken care of, the worry of where they will spend eternity. And for those of us who know you, Lord, there are some who walked into this room, I'm convinced, with heavy burdens on their heart. Lord, take those burdens away. Let them trust in you. Let them put you first in their lives and believe that you will do what needs to be done. You will give them the strength each and every day to get through what they need. Father God, we love you. And Lord, when we say we trust you with our lives, let us mean it. In Jesus' name, amen.